This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Um, seeing a presence of a quorum, I'm calling to order this meeting of the uh, Regional School Committee. Um, at 6.33 p.m. on Tuesday, October 20th. Um, and we'll start with a, um, a roll call attendance. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Kenny. Kenny present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Ms. Steger. Steger present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Ms. Stancer. Stancer present. And McDonald present, um, and Mr. Sullivan is is not yet here. Um, we also have um, Ms. Our student uh, representative, Ms. Gribko. Can you hear us? Yeah. Um, and Dr. Morris and uh, Ms. Um, Ms. Sharkis. Um, so our first order of business, I'm going to call um, a move that we enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation of AFSCME if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares, I declare, and uh, with intention of returning to open session. Is there a second? Lord second. Moved by McDonald, seconded by Lord. Um, and we will take a roll call vote. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, I. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, I. Ms. Lord. Lord, I. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, I. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, I. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, I. Mr. Sullivan. I'll abstain since I just joined. Thanks. Um, and uh, McDonald, I. The motion passes um, 8 0 1. One abstain. Um, so, uh, welcome back to open session. Um, and our first order is um, public comment. Um, and I will note um, we have two public comment periods um, this evening. We have one during uh, the region only meeting, and then another public comment period during the joint meeting um, topics. Uh, several uh, individuals submitted public comment and labeled it specifically as for region. Um, uh, and others did not. And so for the most part, if it was not labeled specifically as being for the region, um, I'm including it in the joint meeting um, public comment. Um, and for the most part, unless somebody specific, even, uh, actually that, that's all I'll say at this point. Um, so I will share my screen. We have just a couple for, um, for the region. Okay. Can folks see this screen? Sorry, can folks see the public comment? Yeah, okay.
Now, as mentioned, um, we will um, any any comments that were not specifically marked as being for the region um, will be covered in our joint meeting of public comment. Um, and with that, uh, move on to the next item, which is uh, our uh, memorandum of agreement uh, vote for AFSCME. Um, and based on a discussion that we that the committee just had, um, we will fo follow a similar approach um, as we have with our other bargaining units and hold off on voting until after their membership has voted and ratified this memorandum of agreement. Um, so we will take this back up um, at a future regional school committee meeting. Uh, now, uh, moving on, I um, will let the our Pelham colleagues, the rest of our Pelham colleagues, know that um, we are moving on to our joint joint meeting. And while they're joining us, I'll call to order this meeting of the Amherst School Committee at 7.04 p.m. on Tuesday, October 20th. Um, and I will ask take a roll call attendance. Mr. Demling. And Demling present. Ms. Her Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. And McDonald present. And we'll pause till Ms. Hall and Ms. Barlow are able to join us. Um, Chair Hall, we've um, already called the Amherst School Committee to order, so whenever you're ready to call the Pelham School Committee to order, you may. Okay, sorry to sit here with that dumb look on my face. Didn't realize you were waiting for me. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Finally, seeing the presence of a quorum, I'll call to order this meeting of the Pelham School Committee at 7.05, and we'll start with roll call attendance. Uh, Mr. Menino. Menino present. Ms. Kenny. Kenny present. Ms. Stancer. Answer present. And I do not see Ms. Barlow on my screen. Um, okay, and Hall present. Thank you, Chair McDonald. Yeah. Um, so our first order um, for the uh, is to approve the minutes of um, September 29th. Um, our agenda also said October 6th, but I um, don't believe that we those were included in our packet. So we will review September 29th only tonight. Mr. Delling. Uh, just one minor change on number nine, minimum contribution act change to minimum contribution study. Ms. Spitzer? Another small edit. Um, the third paragraph on page three, where it's talking about the CARES Act, I just think it should be all caps. Ms. Hall? Um, just a small cleanup thing in uh, number five. Um, approving the minutes. Um, I move to approve the minutes for Pelham, not for the region. Under um, item six, um, the voice messages, um, the gentleman's name is Ted, T-E-D, um, Solos, S-O-U-L-O-S. I also had under item 10, the second paragraph, um, the first sentence, it says, and the results are that we will need major renovations after the first round of testing. I don't believe that that's what Dr. Morris said. Um, it, I don't know if it was min minor renovations, if that fixes that. Okay. Yeah. 
I would say updates and renovations to me sounds like ripping things out of walls and replacing them. And what yeah. we need was, was people to go into the machines and make fixes more than renovations. I'll look at Mr. Harrington, who has better language for this stuff than me, and he's giving me a thumbs up, so I'll go with it. Minor updates. Um, and on the top of the next page, it says that Fort River, Wildwood, and Pelham tested at four air changes per hour. Crocker Farm had areas that tested low as well. I'm not sure. It, it Was it low or some rooms were low? Yeah, so there were, um, there was a couple rooms that were low. Yep. Okay, so that's correct then. Okay. Um, I think that was all I had. Oh, nope. Um, on page four, um, just above section D, it says, Ms. Seeger is interested in watching how this comes together. Dr. Morris said most people do not have goals to reflect on. And I think it's sort of, it should, it should be, most people do not have as a goal to reflect. Um, and then under D, agenda planning, we are meeting next Tuesday to discuss, it should say, um, meeting next Tuesday in executive session to discuss APEA negotiations. Mr. Harrington. Yeah, so the fourth page, which is three, third paragraph down, said Mr. Harrington shared a video that will clarify this vision. The, uh, the video, the, the two videos that I put were, were more about the process of the evaluation than anything else. Mm -hmm. And that's all I have. I appreciated having those links in the minute, so because we lose them in, when they're shared in the chat. So thank you, um, Ms. Sharkas, for including that. <laughs> Any other edits? Mr. Harrington, do you have do, uh, <laughs> Okay. Um so I'll um I'll move for the region to approve the minutes of September 29th. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald, second by Spitzer. And we'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes for the region nine to zero. Uh, Ms. Hall. All right, I'll move that Pelham accept the minutes of September 29th. Is there a second? Second. All right, moved by Hall, seconded by Stancer, and we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, aye. And Hall, aye. Thank you. I'll move for the Amherst School Committee to accept the meeting minutes as edited. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald, second by Spitzer. We'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes five to zero. Uh, okay, and now we will move on. Our next item is um, public comment. Um, and as mentioned, the um, this includes, as, as I mentioned in the regional school committee meeting, this includes comments that um, we're not clear whether they were intended for region or joint. So um, uh, if it, I won't go into, I won't say more. Um, for those who submitted email comments after five o'clock, so I, I made an, um, continue to accept public comment through 5 p.m. given the late notice of the, um, the late email from uh, the district. And, but a comment that was received after 5 p.m. 
we will share at our next um, meeting, which the region has posted a meeting for Thursday of this week. So I will start with the voicemail comments and then we'll move on to the uh, printed comments. My name is Stephanie Hockman. I'm a resident of Pelham and a parent of an eighth grader and ninth grader. Today's announcement by Dr. Morris stating that phase one learning is returning to remote education is extremely disappointing. I do not know what is worse. The fact that we are allowing cases in towns and counties around us to dictate the decisions for our children, or the fact that the negotiations that resulted in these outrageous metrics were done behind closed doors with people who only had the interest of faculty and staff in mind. Our teachers and staff are absolutely important and vital to the education of our children, but they are no more important than our students. Those that should be the main focus of all negotiations and the focal point of all decisions, the students in our community. The students have obviously been the furthest thing from the minds of those who negotiated the APA contract and the metrics do not reflect our community and what our families and students want and deserve. Our students in our four towns have done their part to stay safe, but they are being punished. Our education system is teaching them that their actions, their conscientious efforts will not be rewarded, but instead punished. If the negotiated metrics included towns outside those of our district because teachers live outside our district or students choose our district for learning, then I suggest we not allow school choice or we no longer pay my tax dollars to those who choose to live in other towns. I choose to pay high tax dollars so my students could go to a diverse school with excellent education, not to sit at home learning remotely, frustrated from isolation, and anxious when the slightest internet issue arises, just because someone who lives in Greenfield or Springville are not doing their part or being as smart as my kids. If this elected school committee and higher administration can't take emergency action to remedy this situation and make the metrics representative of our community, then it, it should not be surprised when the inequity that results and most people no longer live in our diverse community for them to administer. The sorts of decisions that do not affect our four towns means that those with means will leave for institutions that can provide in-person instruction without such egregious hurdles or to obtain resources to supplement their children's education. Those with means will help their children, but that means the education gap widens for those in our community that do not have the means. They will suffer the most. Your actions mean those living in Amherst and our four towns will suffer, but those in Springfield and other towns, which are causing harm to our community, will not be impacted in the same way. The negotiated metrics do not reflect our community, and they are creating insurmountable barriers to education. Your decisions, if not immediately acted upon and changed, will create such a high barrier that those in our community will never scale a wall to actually participate in equitable education. Please. Hello, my name is Aline Lyra, and I live in Amherst, and I'm a mom of a kindergartner and 10th grader in the Amherst school system. Um, I just read the email from Michael Morris. I am very, very frustrated. Um, I don't understand how the school is canceling in person when these numbers does not. They're not looking at the metrics in our town. It's from Springfield and other areas outside of Amherst. And their decision is impacting the quality of education that my son and my daughter are currently receiving. Um, not only that, it's also affecting my job because I work as a preschool teacher for the University of Massachusetts and we are currently open and going on the furlough and I, we have to cover the floor and I have to be at home to virtual learn my son instead of being in my job helping the other teachers who are mandated to work. I am very, very frustrated, and I do not understand how this metric from outside of our town is impacting the education that my son, my kids are choosing. I chose to stay in Amherst because of the quality of education that we, we give to our children. As a person who went to school here, I always brag about Amherst, but this is beyond frustration. And it is unacceptable that we continue to go through this and you're impacting the children's social emotional skills 
their mental health, and the parents. I have no, I have nothing else to say. It's just, it's very, it's unbelievable and very frustrating. And I don't think there's enough words to describe the emotions that a lot of the parents in the Amherst school system are feeling right now. Thank you for listening. Dear school committee, APA, and administrators, my name is Renata Shepard. My children are in second and 10th grade. These recent news that cases in Springfield will push our in-person start even further is not only upsetting, but it is a decision that does not make sense for our area. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gerald Downs, and uh, I'm a parent of a student in Amherst. And I just want to uh, state my um, my disgust, frankly, at having to shift back to remote learning. I think that this remote learning um, is a poor substitute for face-to-face -face learning. I think our students are suffering, particularly the youngest student. My the youngest students, my child is. Uh, in second grade, and this is absolutely not good for him. Uh, I'm very frustrated that the numbers that were agreed to are far too low. These numbers are not in Amherst. They're not due to UMass. They're not due to some of the surrounding towns either, like uh, like Pelham or Shrewsbury. So I do not understand why uh, this triggers a shift back to remote learning when it's so clearly having an adverse effect on, on our students. I beg you to reconsider. I think that this is a mistake to shift back, particularly at this time of year, when it's more possible to have windows open, to have all sorts of outdoor activities compared to later in the year, when cases may well go back up and weather will be more harsh for those kinds of remedies. Uh, if I'm happy to talk about this more. My telephone number is 413-559. Hello, my name is Matt Blackner. I live in Amherst. Um, my daughter is a first grader at Fort River. Um, I'm calling to just express my frustration about schools closing next week. Um, I think that the agreement with the teachers union is uh, totally absurd in that we've tied the fate of the education of the children in our town and our district to other counties and other school districts, uh, which has no logical sense to me. It just seems designed to cause schools to close more frequently. Um, on a personal level, my daughter has been back at school for four days now. Um, she'll get another three this week. And she's been so, so happy. Uh, the night before her first day, she was bouncing off the walls with excitement. She comes home every day, so happy, just talking nonstop about how much she's having fun with her friends and like her teachers. Um, but beyond just the personal side of things, she is unprompted now several times with how much more she learns when she's in school and how much she's on the computer, even though I know the teachers are doing their best. She doesn't learn nearly as much. Um, and the fact that a six year old can glean that uh, means it's pretty darn obvious. And uh, the adults should uh, be able to see that clearly as well. Um, so to summarize, I'm just incredibly frustrated and angry. I feel like the best interests of the children in our town are being sacrificed for other reasons, uh, which I can't uh, understand at all. And that if we actually care about educating kids, they need to be in school in person. Um, and better now when it's warm than later when it's cold. Um, but this is just so disappointing. And I think such a terrible uh, situation that we created for ourselves to accept. Um, so, oh, thank you. Are you, um, can you guys see the screen? Okay. Um, for those viewing at home, I apologize um, because we um, continue to accept uh, public comment until five. Um, I don't believe that this document has been posted online, um, but it will be posted on our website um, tomorrow morning.
Um, for, for those of you that noticed that there were duplicates or what felt like duplicates, um, it was because those, those emails actually came in separately, um, one listed as region, one listed as joint. So um, I honored that request. Um, and there, and also you noted that some of them um, were received prior to the email that we received that, um, that was sent this afternoon closing schools. So the reference to we may be closed by Friday was obviously sent earlier. Pulling up the agenda. Okay. Um, and, and just as another reminder, um, any comments that came in after five o'clock will be included. Um, I have them, they're marked and noted for our next um, our next meeting, uh, public comment session, section. Um, so now we'll move on to uh, the superintendent's update. Um, Dr. Morris? Yep, and, and do you mind if I add to that last comment that the next meeting where they would be displayed at is, is two days from now, two nights from now, it's Thursday night. Correct, thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Yeah, um, there is. Uh, we posted a, a new um, regional school committee meeting um, for Thursday um, that will have public comment and an executive session. So I have a rather lengthy update. So uh, I think you know perhaps I'll just ask those questions or comments a couple times because there's a couple. Um, let's see, I've got one, two, three. Got nine updates to give. So uh, I apologize. Uh, I'll try to be as as um, clear as I can be. So the first one, I'm just going to read the closure letter that was sent and add a little bit of context, but just in case people didn't receive it. Dear ARPS community, as I've shared with the ARPS community previously, we are continually monitoring the COVID-19 case data in our area to measure it against the metrics for in-person learning agreed to by the school committee and the Amherst Palm Re Education Association. And there's a little asterisk in the, the metrics are listed below. <laughs> While the data shared in the ARPS update last Friday met the metrics to continue in-person learning this week, it has shifted since that time. As a result, phase one in-person school will continue for the rest of this week to promote consistency and provide time for staff, families, and students to transition back to remote learning, which will start next Monday, October 26, for at least two weeks, as per the agreement cited above. To be clear, there has not been a significant uptick in cases in Amherst, Leverett, Pelham, or Shutesbury, nor have we seen the UMass cases affect our numbers much locally. However, there's been a significant enough increase in cases in Hamden and Hampshire counties outside our four towns that has pushed the metric over the 28, per, 28 new cases per week level. Per the agreement, phase one in-person school will start again on Monday, November 9th, if the health metrics are met at that time. The new dates for phases two and three in-person learning are still being finalized since they're complicated by the break and holiday schedules for release in the Friday update. Um, I think just to put a finer point on it, our active cases, which you know are cases where people are still in quarantine, is my understanding of that, um, are at the lowest level in the town of Amherst that they've been in weeks, um, and that's a good thing. And uh, UMass has had, I think, we're at five straight days with zero cases, which is great. Um, so I just, you know, for anyone who's nervous about, you know, we have three more days of school before the closure starts. Um, at this point, um, the cases in Amherst are, and our four towns are very, very low. Um, so, you know, I felt comfortable uh, moving forward with continuing and, and ending the week and then um, starting that closure period on Monday of next week. So that's obviously a big topic. So while I've got eight more, uh, I figure I'll pause here and see if there are questions or comments from the committee, if that's okay with the chairs. Yes. Um, Mr. Demling, and then Ms. Spitzer. Yeah, I have a few questions. So, I mean, just first off, um, I mean, I am frustrated beyond words about the current situation, but given the fact that we have, uh, like you and the chair have said, uh, executive session posted for this Thursday to, um, I'm just reading the posting, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the APEA. I'm not going to comment further or ask you to comment further about what you think of the auto closure metric or possibility of change, but we are obviously had a lot of public comment about it. Uh, the, the, the few questions I have are about, really about process and information. So in, in the, the statement today, there's this ellipsis Okay, I wouldn't often focused on, on an ellipsis, but it, it's it's key in this point because it, it says the statement is one with the asterisk about what the metric is. So if the metrics fail to be met at any time, the districts will return to full remote for all students. Dot dot dot, 
And then provided there are fewer than 28 new cases per week and then goes on to explain. So those are two different sections from the memorandum, memorandum of agreement that when you put them together, you draw the conclusion that, oh, even though we're only publishing the value um, on Friday and making the closure decision then, actually, if, if the metric trips that 28 threshold, right, at any point, then, then that's it. Then in the following two weeks, schools are, 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 are closed. Um, and that's not, that's not clear, <laughs> um, I think, in my opinion, from previous communications. And so it, it just leads a couple of questions that I've asked sim similarly in the past. One, can, can we just post the memorandum? Of, we keep referring to like various components of it. Can we just post the MOA publicly? It's, and it's publicly accessible. And then yeah. parents have questions they can trove through it themselves. And then you know, the other question, and, and I don't know how practical this is, is can we publish what the daily value is? Now, I understand that would require more work, um, and it may be a technical obstacle, but the fact is, is that there are now multiple <laughs> uh, alternate sources of this daily value. And because we don't produce an ARPS official daily value, people are turning to that. And, and this event has shown a light that, well, it's actually kind of relevant to track it <laughs> every day because that could, even if it happens on a Monday or Tuesday like it did, or Sunday like it did this time, that could mean the following two weeks and then parents have to plan and whatnot. So um, I have a couple other questions, but just those two, if, if you could address. Sure, the MOA has been posted on our website for since it was agreed to. It's if uh, maybe you could post a different place, but it's under uh, the fall 2020 website under staff, since it's an agreement with the staff. Um, it's at the very bottom, it's the last, I think if I'm remembering correctly, it's at the bottom fall 2020, there's you know sort of a couple headings one of them is staff, and I believe the last one is the MOA. Um, so it is publicly accessible. Daily value, that's something we can definitely do. Um, that's a good good suggestion. Um, and um, we will work on it. We frankly, in this situation, have a little bit of time to work on it. Um, and uh, But it's um, that's, that's a good suggestion that we can implement. Thank you. Ms. Spitzer. Thanks. Um, so I guess I just wanted to start off by first just recognizing how disappointed and upset parents are because and I'm including in that kids, teachers, staff, and you know, myself included. You know, yesterday morning I was driving around town and it was so nice to see the buses out and the kids in masks waiting with their parents. Um, so, the, you know, this pandemic just keeps re resulting in losses and the loss today, you know, felt really really real for our community and at the same time i recognize that it's completely in line with the agreement that we all voted on um well not all of us but many of the members of this committee you know voted so i'm not eager to revisit the agreement but i think and i'm assuming this is what's going to happen on thursday is that we really do need to come together to try to find a path forward that's less disruptive because it just it, it feels really wrong to be moving um back and forth at such short notice um one question I have is for the um, for the two week wait period. Is that something that's going to start on the day we tripped the you know went over the metric, or is that something that is always going to be like from the day when our we closed our doors, we need to keep the doors closed for two weeks? It'd be the latter. As okay. how you know, it was discussed in negotiations and, and I believe is the fair interpretation. Thank you. Ms. Hall. Um, so just, a, I guess, a process question. So there's a meeting, a region meeting on Thursday in executive se session. So it's possible then that coming out of that meeting, there might be a reason for a later joint meeting to revisit some things too for all three committees. Or at this point, are any conversations about like the health metrics and anything? Those are exclusively like the region in executive session. Dr. Morris. So the region is the negotiating agent for all three committees by policy, um, and so. Um, much like anyone else, I think if there's feedback that any 
committee member would want to give to the region um, or to the chair of the region, or um, they could do that. But um, I, I, I don't want to make a decision, but I think because this is related, potentially related to negotiations, the region would be the group that would be the negotiate. It feels awkward to say. I, I mean, I have no interest in cutting anyone out of the dialogue, so I hope you know that. Um, well, yeah, and I'm not trying to make anything awkward. I just purely because I don't have experience with this, wanting to understand the process. When there's an MOA in place, anything opening back up, what happens then? But that's enough of an answer. Oh, sorry, go ahead, but you're going to talk. <laughs> oh, no, I was just going to say, I mean, you know, I think I would encourage members who are not part of the region, if they have feedback, to actually share them, you know, um, with the chair of the region because i think that it's not that it, i think that would be the the process wise the way that that could be communicated effectively okay all right thank you mr menino i'm not sure how i share my position do i do it now do i do it later i mean uh, <laughs> how do i share my uh, concerns um i see several several which side um <laughs> desires to respond, I would say later, um, given that it's um, part of the, the, if it's um, related to the topic of the executive session, then later through um, uh, email is, is appropriate. Um, Dr. Morris, is that what? Yeah, I, so I think this is a, a, I think I'd rather just be transparent and explicit about it. I think this is a fine line because if there's frustrations about something that was negotiated, uh, or an interest in in going back to those negotiations, we don't do that in public meetings. That's why there's executive sessions. Um, I think if it's frustration that students about the letter I read and that students aren't won't be in school for two weeks, that's not related to an MOA. I mean, it's indirectly related to an MOA, but I mean, certainly anyone like Ms. Spitzer did can express sadness, uh, uh, and I think it will in a second, uh, about the impact it, it has on kids and families. And And there's no... There's nothing barring you from sharing any of that, but I think if, it, if it's about the particulars of an MOA or particulars of a negotiation, either past, present, or future, I would strongly urge you to not share those publicly. Well, I'll express my position of sadness regarding the students being cut out from classes. Uh, it was abrupt. Uh, I know it's the subject of a previous agreement, uh, but there's gotta be a way around this somehow. And I'll address later in private with the chair of the region. Um, I, I see your hand up, uh, Mr. Demling, but I, I would also like to, um, before um, circling back to you, just express my um, extreme sadness. I mean, listening to reading the letter and listening to the public comment this evening, as well as the reading the emails, it just really, I don't have a kindergartner or first grader, but the, hearing the pain and the frustration and the anguish in, in our families is, is really challenging. And I, and I do hope, share um, Ms. Spitzer's hope that we can um, help the situation and so that we're meeting the needs of our families and our students, um, um, especially our students, um, better. I think also sort of to talk indirectly about the MOA, I think, you know, as we focus on the, you know, within the MOA or any agreement, sort of the implementation is sometimes the, the where the challenge is even after, you know, even if everybody, you know, and, and no matter what it is, and I think one of the things that we're learning is that, you know, despite all of our efforts, there's a, there's still a lot of question and a lot of um, confusion and um, and uncertainty regarding you know just like how do we implement this and what does it mean and I think that's also part of, you know contributing to the pain and the frustration that the community is feeling because it's really hard to understand and you know we've even had questions like just hearing our own process questions so I think we have significant opportunity to to keep working on that together with the union um, Mr. Demling. Yeah, I just wanted to um, point out that I don't think we've completely figured out here exactly what the proper way is to 
communicate and and opine on these things as they move through the various stages. So for example, here's what I mean. You know, back in August, we had multiple meetings in a row where we all talked openly and had good discussions about metrics. Right. And Dr. Morris had a couple presentations and he gave a list of evidence and we had back and forth and we said, okay, here's this value. So the public got a chance to hear us on that. When once that component became part of an agreement that was under negotiation, we stopped talking about it in public, which was appropriate for at least for the region, because it's the region that was in executive session. Um, now that that agreement is done, it's it's a little ambiguous as to what's appropriate to say publicly. I mean, is if you draw it to its logical, logical conclusion, um, it sounds a little absurd to say, well, it's in the MLA, therefore the public will never again get to hear a public opinion or discussion among the school committee about what we think of metrics, which given their import seems a little odd. And I think, I think, it, I think it gets even a little more odd for members here that aren't members of the region. Now, you know, when Mr. Menino said that, it, it, it raised for me that like, okay, yes, by policy, the region negotiates for the three districts, but Mr. Menino and Ms. Hall aren't members of the of the region and you know they're not therefore they won't be in that executive session and so um you know i i think we should be a little cautious about saying oh it's 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 some somehow related to the agreement therefore we can't speak about it i think i think we're still figuring this out um and i think we need to be mindful of that especially when the, we are obviously getting a lot of public input about what we think of this <laughs> dr morris and then uh, mr Menino, i saw your hand also but dr morris and you're muted. Sorry, <laughs> being without hat happened a couple times. Um, uh, just to clarify my comments from before, I, I don't. I hear where Mr. Demling is coming from, and I don't want to do the back and forth. I think what I wish I had said is, since there's a currently posted meeting to talk about this in an executive session, um, given that meeting, I think that was what was causing me pause, and perhaps giving you know the advice I gave was was framed that there. This is not a topic that seems like the committee won't have an opportunity at least to discuss next steps that it would like to pursue with it. And and that I think that was causing me pause about having a more open conversation because it's already on an agenda. You're right about the region and uh, members of the Pelham School Committee uh, who are not on the region. Um, it's a super awkward system. I'll get into more three districts don't make sense all the time stuff in a little bit on a financial level. Um, so we, we can riff on that a little bit later, uh, actually two different riffs on that, just in my superintendent update. So, um, but I think I just wanted to clarify where my my comment and my advice was coming from. It really was, was framed that there is an executive session in a posted meeting 48 hours from, actually almost exactly 48 hours from now. So um, I think that that was really where I was coming from. Mr. Menina, did you have a comment? Yeah, my only concern is um, the low bar is an important part of the memo of understanding. It's probably the most important part. Uh, and I don't think there's going to be an opportunity for me to hear everybody's on the committee's viewpoint if the current understanding is you can't talk about something that's part of the memo of understanding. Uh, it sort of feels like I'm being shut out of the conversation. I know that's not intentional, but basically I'm, I'm an observer, not a participant. I'm a member of the uh, Pelham School Committee and it affects the, the kids in my school, but I can't talk about it. I feel disenfranchised, <laughs> but you know, I know that's not the intent, but I do feel disenfranchised. That's it. Dr. Morris. Just very briefly, I think if you're in a Pelham school committee meeting, you might feel more enfranchised, but right now this is a joint meeting with one of the committees being the negotiating body. Um, and so um, there may be an opportunity to, for you to feel more enabled to have that conversation uh, when it's not a meeting with the negotiating body seated. And I, you know, you'll hear later in this update, I'm going to be asking for a Pelham specific meeting. It's not necessarily planned on that topic, Mr. Menino, but um, uh, we'll get to it in a little bit. Ms. Kenny. 
Oh, hmm. Maybe this is part of it. So I'll ask my question, and if we can't talk about it, you can tell me we can't talk about it. How's that? So um, there's the, oh my gosh, I'm not going to get this right. J M L S C, right? Um, and they are an advising body that comes into play when these metrics get tricked, right? Um, can you talk to us at all about how that conversation went? Um, is, is that, is that kosher? <laughs> um, I don't know, but I think I can give enough without, <laughs> you know, we had a productive, we met, um, yesterday afternoon, we had a productive conversation about the metrics, about next steps. I think it was a good, it was making sure that we're communicating with our bargaining unit. Um, I don't know. I felt like it was a productive meeting. Um, to be able to talk about uh, what the metrics were and what next steps were that there wasn't, uh, I shared no concerns about students finishing the week. So we were able to have that conversation. Um, you know, I, I don't know, to me, it, it felt like a productive collaborative conversation about the, you know, how we were going to apply that aspect of the contract. So, um, you know, we had met the Friday before cause we meet on a weekly basis as per, the MOA, but in this instance, it felt right to meet um, more quickly. And again, I, I felt like it was a productive conversation. Seeing, I'm not seeing any other comments right now. So I, back over to you, Dr. Morris. And you're muted again. <laughs> Usually my max is two in a meeting, so I'm at three now. I don't know if that <laughs> um, got a little more talking that I have to do. So, um, in all seriousness, I do want to publicly thank the staff members for making the first four days of schooling so powerful for students. Um, I know this is a sort of perhaps awkward to talk about given the first update I just gave, but it's no less important to note um, that it's been it's been joyous. Someone asked me how the first two days were. Um, Thursday was my favorite work day in many, many months, probably more than that. Um, just seeing how wonderfully supportive our staff were and welcoming students to the building. I was able to start the day at Crocker Farm and see uh, our preschoolers, our youngest students uh, walk in. And I wasn't the only person cheering up, just seeing you know three and four year olds uh, come into the building and be welcomed by the coordinator, by teachers, paraeducators and others. Uh, I then was able to go over to the high school where students from the middle school and high school uh, were able to attend. One of the things I heard were there were students who uh, were choosing not to access um, distance learning, who uh, people were so happy to see because they weren't showing up on screens. If they were, their cameras were off and uh, they wanted to be in school. Um, and even for, you know, some perceptions of high school students and not feeling like it's cool or whatever, um, it was, um, and, um, you know, it was, it was really neat. Um, and then was able to see the drop off at Fort River. Um, and that was also um, equally wonderful and really well managed for the number of cars that came in, which is a uh, much higher than our usual number. Uh, I was able to make it all the schools uh, throughout the day, including Pelham, which was easy with two classes. It was pretty, pretty nice to be able to walk through one was outside and one was inside. Um, but, you know, the general feedback I got uh, from students and families was that it was outstanding and from staff members, too, who, you know, I think any time in a new situation doesn't feel quite the same as normal school. And yet um, there were definite benefits. I had an early childhood educator tell me, you know, at first I was thinking it was going to be horrible that students were in desks and not tables. And then by the third day, she said, you know what, I kind of like this, right? Like she thought from a a chattering point of view. It was contributing to more useful dialogue, um, more academic dialogue, less social dialogue. Um, so uh, I really want to publicly thank the educators, the bus drivers, the man drivers, the monitors, the custodians. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I also heard was how it felt to one staff member who shared with me, all this is just me walking around the buildings, not asking questions, just thanking people. They said, every time I open the door, I feel like there's a custodian cleaning off the door handle. You know, that, that that our full staff was out in force to support students. I, I, you know, I saw arrival at multiple schools and dismissal and, you know, everybody's outside making sure from a safety point of view, both, you know, distancing safety, but also just literal buses and vans and cars and how do we do this? You know, many of our schools reorganize themselves. You know, for instance, Crocker Farm, the buses are now coming down in the Shea Street entrance where the cars are going, you know, the front at the high school, there's multiple 
entrances for the different programs to promote, you know, safety, not necessarily just COVID safety, but again, just everyone's safety, feeling of safety and security for where they're going in the building. Um, you know, it was just, it was fabulous. And so uh, I just want to thank everybody for their work and making such a difference. I know it's more short lived, at least in terms of consecutive days than we had hoped, but it's no less important in terms of the student and family experience um, that we had. And there was just a lot of smiles, right? And I know that's like a very uh, rudimentary way to assess how things are going, but I'd walk in rooms and students and, and staff were all uh, doing school, doing work and having a fabulous time doing it. And, you know, I was in one class and it was a virtual PE lesson or virtual, it was a virtual specials lesson at the elementary level. And the teacher then brought them outside and they were able to knack things and just really creative ways to do that. And it was just wonderful because class sizes are small and that also contributed to everyone feeling much more comfortable. So. It was a really successful first few days of school, and I know we will be for the rest of the week. Uh, I was able to attend a, to three of the meetings that we had with in-person staff this afternoon. The idea was that we were originally gonna share the letter this morning, but we thought it was the respectful thing to be able to talk to in-person staff before the letter went out um, and let them have a reaction. We didn't wanna send it because there was a strong reaction from many in-person staff. Um, we didn't wanna do that while they had kids in the building. We felt like that was not actually fair to staff to do that. Um, so, you know, some really good dialogue and conversations after school is over at the high school with the kind of the intensive needs program. Uh, we did a, a virtual one for the preschool and then in person over at Fort River this afternoon. Um, so, you know, it, it's bittersweet for sure to talk about at this moment in time, but it, it doesn't mean that the staff who are doing really important work shouldn't be commended and acknowledged uh, in a public space. So. I'll pause and see if there are questions for me about the start of in-person before I go through my many other updates. Mr. Denman. So when I think about uh, the, a safe reopening plan, I've kind of coalesced on like four pillars. There's this community spread that, and we just talked about how we define that. So I won't belabor that. Uh, but then there's masks, distancing and, and air exchange. And I know we've talked ad nauseum about that over the course of the summer, but now that we're into it, We've had, I, only, I know it's only been four days, but before this becomes a faded memory, can you talk a little bit about how, that, how that's been going in terms of mass compliance, um, distancing, and, and the air exchange? Has, have things met our expectations? Do we need to make adjustments going forward? Yeah. So um, my perception is that we have met our expectations. The feedback I received from staff is they felt more comfortable um, being in than they anticipated. I've, that's not hard data, but that's anecdotal data. Um, and, you know, it's funny, I use the word smiles. I mean, the mass compliance was really good. Uh, it was really strong from students. Teachers found creative ways for students to be outside a lot. And when you see the smiles, you'd see the, the eye, right? You know, you see that you can still see a smile even with the mask on just because you see it in the face. And, and that's what we saw a lot of. So I do feel like from a safety perspective, um, it felt really good. I will say that, you know, we I've gotten some perhaps not always the most positive feedback about phasing. It felt like 100% the right decision in terms of drop off, pick up, the number of people in the building felt like the right grain size. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of my principals said today, it felt like I was the best principal in the world because there was the right number of kids. If there was ever a question, the counselors, if a student was struggling with something, there was so much ability to be present very quickly and problem solve that would have been much more challenging if half the school was there, for instance, to, to start. Um, so, you know, were there small things that required problem solving? Absolutely. Were they able to be problem solved almost immediately? You know, the feedback I received was yes, that they really were. Um, and so, you know, obviously this is a, a, a big detour that we're on right now, but it did feel like we were on the right pace. Like we'd, we'd gotten through the first couple of days, we were now envisioning phase two and how to get second and third graders in. Uh, you know, the locations were all sorted out um, and the staffing piece we were, were wrapped up with. So it, it really felt like we could problem solve because the scale was the right scale to start with. Um, and so in terms of the planning, it felt really good. You know, people had PPE, they had what they needed to do that. They knew where to go to communicate if something was out, like someone said, oh, you know, we're at a hand sanitizer today and we knew where the hand sanitizer was. Uh, from the fire department, we can't bring barrels of hand sanitizer um, over and store them and all together. So if there's fire code around that, but we, you know, we had these systems that we're able to develop where people were able to problem solve really quickly. 
um, a new day, right? Friday wasn't a day that people, kids were able to be outside as much as they typically would. Um, but again, the systems and structures really worked well. I want to thank the bus drivers and van drivers uh, for their work because uh, we did transport a, a, a fair number of students. And there was work about literally like assigned seating and sign in so you knew exactly where there. So in a worst case scenario, the contract tracing was all there. You didn't have to go and ask people. You knew who was seated where on a bus, on a van, in a classroom. Um, in, in the classroom, people have assigned seats. So students said, I'm 3G. Right. So again, from all those planning for worst case scenarios, people did an incredible job with that. Sorry, I could go on forever on this topic because I feel really passionately about the job our team did, um, the custodial team, the administrative team, teachers, paraeducators. But uh, it felt like it worked well. It felt like there was space for students. Uh, when I walked in rooms, there was never a place where I nor a staff member said it feels kind of too crowded in here. It was quite the opposite. There was uh, plenty of space for student movement, staff movement. Um, and, you know, um, I'm sad that we're going to have to take a pause from that because it, it felt like, you know, quote unquote, it worked. I think in the interest of time, um, we'll just uh, we'll keep going. If you can hold your comment, Mr. Deming, till later, that would be great. Yep. Um, one of the things on that topic, um, actually, I'll hold that part, I'll do it a little bit later. Um, so uh, let's see, my, last week, um, Tuesday, um, I was asked to be on RIAC again, the Racial Imbalance Advisory um, Council um, for the Board of um, Elementary and Secondary Education. We had our first meeting, um, which was very productive. I was asked to facilitate uh, a conversation about best practices post COVID for recruitment and retention of educators of color. A lot of us are very concerned about the fiscal situation, and especially districts like ours that have significantly diversified our faculty. You know, in the last five years, we have 50%. You know, if you look at the DESE data, we have more than 50% um, more staff of color than we had. Um, and so a lot of us are concerned about that. A lot of us are concerned about uh, what that looks like over time in terms of retention. Um, so we had some really good dialogue. There's some new members, which is fantastic. And, you know, I'll just continue to update you uh, as we meet, but the theme for this year is, the area of focus, I should say, is around recruitment and retention of educators of color. So certainly something that we've talked about in this on these committees many times, and I just feel fortunate that I'm uh, enabled to have the dialogue with educators from and school committee members from across the state. There, there was a school committee member from Springfield who was, uh, we call each other uh, RIAC West, because uh, we're the only two. Um, but, uh, you know, the virtual context actually makes it easier to participate in statewide groups like this. So um, you know, I was looking for silver linings and I'm able to be much more present than it would be if I was driving to Worcester or Boston for meetings. Um, uh, today we had a pickup, uh, and yet another pickup for hotspots, Chromebooks and iPads. Um, so in terms of uh, last time or one of the times previous we spoke, we talked about hotspots. We needed to cup um, some more. So we those have come in and been distributed to families who indicated that they were in need of um, of internet, so thank you to Jerry Champagne for that uh, that work. Um, the next thing I'd like to share is an enrollment update. Um, so I know at the last meeting I mentioned the uh, high school enrollment um, numbers being lower, um, and then I'm going to drill down. Even though it's a joint meeting to Pelham, because there's a particularly acute issue that I want to talk about that's specific to Pelham. So let me share my screen. There it is. Uh, there we go. So I imagine you can all see that. I'll try to make it a little bit larger. Um, that's probably a little bit, hopefully a little bit better. Um, so what you can see is at the high school, I'll just say it out loud for people looking, watching this on their phone. We went from 920 students, our official October 9, uh, 2019 numbers. At this point, we're down to 883. Um, this is not official because it has to get vetted and there's a whole process by the state, but this is what we had. So that's a pretty significant drop um, of students, 37 students. At the middle school, we stayed roughly flat. At Crocker Farm, we are down uh, about 26 students. At Fort River, we stayed flat. Pelham, we're down you know, 17, 18 students. And at Pelham, we're down 20 students. And the reason I point out Pelham is as a percentage of the school, that is a huge drop uh, in the enrollment of Pelham. So again, I'm not trying to pick on Pelham. It's just because it's a percentage. I did a little more research on Pelhams. 
I think it's worth noting this is a major concern for the FY22 budget. So when they do, so for next year's budget, for people who don't speak in our bizarre code, um, so it, for um, those budgets, uh, our Chapter 70 money is based on enrollment. And with a drop of 111 students um, from last year to this year, that is going to be a major issue that I have deep concerns about affecting the FY22 budget. Um, there's nothing to be done about it, right? They'll pull our October 1 data, which is going to be give or take what, what's on this sheet. Again, it needs to be verified, and sometimes there's questions about that. Um, but it is concerning. It is a trend that we have seen uh, or we are seeing in other districts. We're not unique in that regard. Um, but it, it's no less concerned, no less concerning than um, because it is happening elsewhere. It still is going to affect us. So, you know, it's also it's just a marker, you know, if one student left or if I was one off to talk about 20 less than 2400 students in our district. It's, you know, it does feel like some theoretical line is being crossed about the size of our district. This is significantly smaller than we've been in the past. Um, this doesn't include the preschool at Crocker Farm, but I want to note based on our decision last year because of COVID, we have very few students enrolled in the preschool at Crocker Farm, which is a whole other conversation for a different day. Um, but we're, we're seeing a rapid decline and this is going to have financial ramifications for us uh, in the next fiscal year. Um, we are starting to do research on where these students have gone, right? Um, there is this uh, factor that we're seeing lots of places of kindergartners just choosing not to enroll uh, because the idea of a virtual enrollment and for students that young for some families doesn't um, isn't appealing to them. Uh, but it does seem like the number of homeschool families has, has doubled-ish. Uh, we'll have real clear numbers on that next week. Um, and private schools. Uh, we have a lot of, lot of students who left uh, the district to go to private schools this year. Um, so, you know, when that data, basically the state works with us to compile that data, and by winter we have the school attending report, and we'll be able to share that more formally at that time because the state plays a meeting role in, in that data and make sure it's clean between private schools, public schools. Um, but it is, uh, again, a major source of concern. Uh, before I go specific into Pelham, I um, want to just give uh, any committee members who have any comments or questions about this set of data opportunity to ask them, um, and, then, and then we'll talk Pelham. Ms. Lloyd. I'm wondering if um, there's a thing that where all the school committee can come together in Massachusetts and just try to petition to get our numbers for Chapter 70 based on the year before the pandemic. I don't know if that would ever fly, but it would make sense for all of us not to be um, penalized for COVID-19. Dr. Mark? Yeah, I believe Senator Comerford has discussed this matter. Um, so by recommendation, either individually or a committee, as if that's something the committee wants to take up, uh, either, again, either individually or as groups, um, I know that she has many districts in her area that are facing the same challenge, and I know she's spoken about this uh, pretty openly uh, about her concerns. Certainly, Rep. Rep Dome and, and Representative Blay, um, I'm not dismissing them, but I, I know I've heard it directly from Senator Comerford, so that's the only reason I mentioned her. But I do think um, talking about legislators sooner as opposed to later, uh, if the committee is interested, would be my recommendation. Thank you. Mr. Demling. Do you, do you think these enrollment numbers are a result of the extent to which we've been able to offer in-person learning? I think they're affected by that? Yes, I do. Um, I, I, I can't explain the private school numbers except for that. Um, and the fact that right now it doesn't appear that our Charter school numbers, you know, the two charter schools that have the most students attending them are in virtual. Um, and so that number hasn't bumped, whereas the private school number has. Um, you know, that leads me to that hypothesis. Again, you know, anecdotally, people have told me that, right, uh, as they've left. That's, that's all anecdote, but um, I think the data points in that direction. Yes. Any other questions on... For Dr. Morris. Ms. Seeger and then Ms. Spitzer. You 
year to year, I imagine the numbers fluctuate. Uh, how much do they usually fluctuate with students coming in and students leaving? Um, significantly less than this. Um, this and to have a hundred over a hundred students less is that is a marker of um, something different happening. Um, and you know what you can see is that it can't be all kindergarten because you know. Uh, you look at the high school, right, that's significantly down. The middle school, we did expect it to be higher um, than that. If you remember, we had a big sixth grade that graduated last year coming up to the middle school. Um, and it certainly doesn't explain some of uh, some of the elementaries, some which stayed more constant and some that had pretty significant drops um, in that. You'll get a sneak peek at Pelham data just for fun because you're not a Pelham member, but in a second, I think that'll actually tell sort of an interesting story. This is why I chose to bring it, even though it's a joint meeting. Ms. Spitzer. I had a similar question about how this, you know, looking at just year to year is, um, doesn't show a trend. So it would just be interesting to see if we could look at this and, and I know it's in our budget document so I did I guess I it's on me to kind of go back and look at our budget documents but it it's clearly concerning and I'm glad that you mentioned that you're going to be doing some more follow-up potentially with the family so there are the families who maybe were never in our district like the kindergartners who right. stayed home and so reaching out to those folks would be difficult but if there are families who were in our district and are no longer in our district is there any reason we can't send them you know, out, do some sort of outreach to find out what was driving the, the decision. Because um, I remember a long time ago, we did that, it was right when I started, there were results from folks who had opted not to um, enroll in our public schools. And it was like a lot of families who had chosen private schools and, and it was a survey. So I'm just wondering if there's any capacity. and. I, there are so many other things to prioritize right now that I, I don't want to add, but it, just because it had been done in the past, it might be worth revisiting and, and looking at if, if there are changes in the in what responses were then and what the responses are now, because I think that would be really important to see. Because I know just anecdotally, like you said, the, the homeschooling piece is interesting because I think it's hard to say are people choosing, assuming if you're choosing homeschooling, you still it's it's not related to this question of being virtual, because you're still not in person if you're doing a homeschooling situation, unlike the choice to go into a private school. So I'd be curious about why are people choosing the homeschool option over the virtual learning option? Because um, yeah. maybe there's something we could learn to improve our virtual learning or just um, respond to that need. Yeah, this is where it gets really complicated. So um, I think it's worth me responding to that just for a minute. Um, I agree about getting more data and we plan to do that. So when we think about homeschooling, there's a number of um, institutions that have popped up, Morse Hill being the most prominent in our area that are offering essentially private school, but they're calling it homeschool. And I won't get into, Morse Hill can respond to why they're calling it that instead of calling it a school. I think I know the answer, but I'm I don't work there. So, you know, our homeschool numbers aren't necessarily all the traditional homeschool numbers. Um, sometimes people have found other quasi in person schools to um, to use to as the primary source of schooling for their child. So that's where it gets the the data itself gets really murky because we do have a number of students that are listed as homeschool, but they're it's not homeschool, like they're not actually staying home, right? Um, they're, they're going other places. Uh, I think the other thing is that homeschooling as an option feels different this time around because, and I'm not picking on Morse Hill, by the way, there are other institutions that are doing that as well. It's just, that's the newest one that's popped up. And I've noticed that we do have some students who are formerly in the district, all three districts actually, um, which I don't know about this. Yeah, all three districts, uh, I believe, who are attending that. I think the other thing is that, you know, when the option is we have people who are concerned about they don't want their kids on screens. And if that's the virtual option that's offered, um, they're making other choices about what they want to do with their children. You know, um, I'm aware that people have hired in-person teachers as a third variable to work with small groups of students who because um, they want an in-person experience. And so, yes, it's listed as homeschool, but it's actually not what you think of as traditional homeschooling. It's 
in-person schooling with people with resources who are paying for someone to come into one person's home and three or four kids are sharing the cost, right? So the data is really murky that way. Uh, it's hard to really disentangle all those pieces. We're going to try our best to do that. Um, but I use those examples to suggest that sort of the monoliths of categories that we have don't really apply to the current situation very neatly. Does that make sense? To provide just context, again, not to disagree with the larger point you're making. No, I think that's really important. And I think being public about the financial consequences for our community about these personal choices is worth noting, right? So I, I think not that everybody needs to carry around with them, you know, the guilt of funding our, of our public schools. But I, I think it's just we all of these choices have consequences, and sometimes they're not well understood, even right. by folks on this committee. So I think it's important to to keep mentioning that. Yep, yep, I agree. I have um, one question, and forgive me if, if you've already answered this, and I missed it, so I apologize. <laughs> um, do, in in the outreach and um, amongst the families that that have left that you've done, have have you asked the question about whether their their decision was intended to be a temporary decision or a, a, a more permanent decision? Because, and I ask, because particularly in the high school where we see a very large drop, there's you mentioned you mentioned Morse Hill as an option, but there's when you get to the high school level, there's even more options. Sort of, if you're you know, particularly for the families of means. Um, you know, to look be even beyond our region um, for for students, and um, you know, families might be thinking of this as as a temporary, you know, one semester or one year kind of sort of thing. And so, I'm just curious of whether we we've asked that question or plan to ask that question. We do plan to. I mean, the outreach we've done so far is very much at the individual level. Now that we have more data, we plan to do a much broader outreach to that. And I think you're right that that's a question that needs to be asked. Um, you know, and I, I'm going to be a little I'm dour. I think I know the meaning of that word. Like, this, I just have a lot of not so great information to share tonight. So I'm not trying to be um, dramatic about it. But, you know, when we look at some of the schools and school sizes, you know, for many, many years, we tried to keep the high school, you mentioned it, at around 1,000 because we felt like that was the right size to be able to maintain the type of comprehensive high school we want. And, and I do have concerns about 883 and, and being able to finance you know, the comprehensive level of programs, I'm not getting ahead of myself, but that's why I'm bringing it to the committee and the public's attention early, is it's very real. Um, the consequences, as people noted, are very real to this. And I don't want to get to spring or winter and people say, where did this come from that we have a fiscal problem um, separate from the COVID stuff? I mean, some of it obviously is going to be the COVID stuff, and that's going to be its own uh, budget challenge for all three committees this spring. But some of it's going to be with our, with our current enrollment, um, that's going to be a, a real challenge. And, you know, our class size at the high school are, by and large, on average, really, really wonderful right now. And that's a great thing. I'm, I'm never going to speak about that being a bad thing. At the same time, you know, when we talk about fiscal feasibility uh, long term, I do have concerns about these numbers. Um, and we'll talk about Pelham more acutely in a second. Um, so, you know, I'm not trying to um, alarm anyone, but I also feel like I'm not doing my job if I don't communicate raw data that, that has real implications for us in the future. Mr. Deming. So, Dr. Morris, I appreciate your moderation, um, but I mean, I, I, I will, uh, I think we should try to alarm people because I think this is alarming, you know, because we are 83 at the high school is, my opinion, in danger of triggering a death spiral. And by that, I mean decreased enrollment leads to de decreased funding, which means we need to decrease our services, which means people are less likely to want to go to the high school because of other options, which leads to decreased enrollment, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, when you get the money back, you can't just, you can't just throw it back on the fire. You know, you have those students that are gone and you have a new reality. And um, I mean, I asked you the question before, do you think this is related to our in-person? I'll admit that was a bit facetious. I mean, you know, I, you talked about those other kind of options of uh, non-traditional homeschooling. We haven't mentioned the word pods. You know, I mean, the, the, the reality is that if you have means right now, you can buy in-person learning and, and we're not offering it. And, and, and that's, that's a big driver here. And you know, I don't say that because I've spoken to every one of these, you know, data points. 
but 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 we know this is the case and and we're in real danger in terms of uh the future of public schools that if that if we don't do something strongly and soon that the, our public schools could look a lot different for the coming generations and you know i i I, I hesitate to say that in those terms and be that dramatic, but I think the economic impact from a pandemic and what is happening here and what we've been able to do so far with maximizing in-person learning this year, which is not a lot, um, is meets that threshold. So I just wanted to add that comment. Thank you. So that segues to Pelham, if it's okay, if I could drill in on that. And I know it's a joint meeting, but I actually felt like this was important enough. I didn't want to wait for a Pelham specific meeting and it was related to this topic. Um, I will be a little more dramatic talking about my concerns about Pelham. Um, and so, you know, I did think a lot about whether to share this at a joint meeting, but I feel like, you know, we're, we're in a supervisory union with Amherst and these students go to the region. So, you know, um, I felt like I should share it. Let me see if I can change the screen to Pelham. Um, can people see that now for Pelham? Yes. Okay. So here's the enrollment, and, and for Pelham folks, they see this or some version of this at, at many of their meetings in terms of their enrollments. And, and one thing to note is that kindergarten's low, but it's not that low, 15, you know, so we're not seeing just that Pelham um, is low, but you could see that across the grade level bands, we've seen um, a loss of enrollment um, really across the board here. And at 37 choice students, that's the lowest I was going to go back today, and then I things happened, and I didn't get around to it. That's the lowest than I can remember in many, many years in Pelham. I, you know, I've been this district, you know, at least one of these three districts for 20 years. That's as as about as low as as it may have been in 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 that generation, um, and it's a huge cause of concern. Um, I'm just going to be really blunt about it. This is not sustainable to have 105 students in Pelham K to six, and 37 of them be choice. It's not something that is fiscally sustainable. Um, and, and I'm not talking five years down the road. I'm not talking 10 years down the road. I'm talking much more narrowly and acutely uh, than that. And so we do need to have a Pelham meeting to talk about this. Um, I am deeply, deeply concerned about the finances of Pelham. You know, even just like what we've had to spend this year, there's no huge CARES Act fund for Pelham the same way there has been for some of our other communities in Amherst, you know, in particular, but the region itself, even for the school-based CARES Act. Um, so, um, you know, I know uh, Principal Whiting Jones has done a great job of advertising the school. We have had some new choice kids join. It's not that there hasn't been effort, so there's been rejection. She's contacted many families. We had some new, new students start right before the school year in grade one to get our numbers to 10. Um, but I think to the question asked earlier about whether the duration question, it, it's really important here. And um, I, because uh, it's a joint meeting, I probably won't go into more detail. Um, but those of you who have been in Pelham um, a while, if you look at that number of 37 and 105, I think you all know that that's not what we're accustomed to seeing and that it's, it's frankly not sustainable. And uh, I have courage concerned about the current fiscal year with those numbers, and I have a lot of concerns about the next fiscal year with those numbers. So um, to Mr. Demling's point about before about being me being moderated, um, I'll be less moderated about Pelham because my concerns are, are much more imminent and acute uh, about how that school is funded and financed and moves forward in the ways that we want it to. Mr. Menino? At that Pelham only meeting, could you give a comparison for all these three columns last year and this year? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, Ms. Barlow and then Ms. Hall. Um, does it matter if some of these families do, is it just a temporary leave from Pelham, they come back, or does it not impact, would it impact the following year's budget if those if some of those families did come back? Right, so it's an October 1 count every year that affects the next fiscal year. So for this fiscal year, it what's done is done, so to speak. Um, for the next fiscal year, right, that'll affect the next fiscal year. So if students return for the fall of 22, it, it, excuse me, in the fall of 21, it would affect the fiscal year that follows that. That's the, the trend always is that 
it can't it can't affect the current fiscal year because the fiscal year already started so we wouldn't know it till october so that's how the formula is is it uses the the current fiscal year current fiscal year's october 1 enrollments affects the following year's state funding yeah sorry i wasn't clear about that um miss hall did you have your hand raised before i did yes um yeah i mean i i have one million questions and I will wait for our Pelham only meeting. I guess I would just say I would like to, and I know we have agenda planning later, but I think it's important to do that sooner rather than later. It's going to be, it's and it's going to be more than just one Pelham only meeting to um, figure some of this stuff out. So um, yeah, I would say don't moderate yourself because this is, there's nothing moderate about this. Ms. Stancer. Uh, is there any way to know how much the school choice was affected by the fact that we can no longer guarantee the Pelham students going up into the middle school and high school? There's no way to know, but I think the anecdotally and my hypothesis is that was a pretty low factor this year. I think collectively the world is thinking less into the future far distance and much more living in the here and now. So I think, uh, you know, I didn't hear much of that, which I heard last year. Um, okay. I think this year was was not related to that. Okay. Um, Ms. Barlow? Oh, sorry. Um, we, we talked about this in the region. If, when, if, when you click on raise hand, please just remember to take your hand down. Ms. Seeger. Uh, so what I'm curious about, um, I'm familiar that with school choice, um, but generally my understanding is what generally happens is that money for school choice comes into the district the year that the students are there and is generally spent the following year. So this, this means that, that uh, Pelham will have less money the following year. What I'm curious about, just more of a clarifying question, is how do school choice numbers affect Chapter 70, if at all? So two parts to that. So in, and I don't want to do the history of Pelham School Choice because I don't think that will be interesting to most people here. Um, but I think the thing to note about Pelham is for many years, Pelham was spending, I think it is relevant to all districts, was spending more of its school choice revenue than it was bringing in. In other words, it built up a fairly large balance. Uh, I think this is relevant because we, we increased our school choice use at all districts. So this is applies to all. And so if we this year bring in less revenue, and this would be significantly less, we're gonna end up, we budgeted for using more than we spent, which is gonna make an operational deficit for next year. Um, because, you know, essentially the budget was built with income that it may not come. So uh, that's gonna be its own problem in Pelham. In Amherst, it works much more how you described, it affects the next year's budget. Um, but um, in Pelham, it, it essentially functions uh, bluntly as part of the operating budget um, is because it's such a large percentage of the Pelham student population and Pelham budget. So in terms of affecting Chapter 70, I don't believe it has much of an impact at all um, on that particular component, but that's a question I can have Doug come back and respond to. Um, chapter 70, I'm just writing it down, um, and I will loop back to you all with the answer. Did you have another question, Ms. Seeger? No. Okay. okay. It, um, since there's a Pelham uh, only committee meeting coming up, um, if, if folks are okay to move on to the next. Yep. Um, and uh, now I'm going to make one third of the people happy and the other two thirds unhappy, or I guess some people are going to be split in their thoughts. So the governor put out the rest of the fiscal year 21 budget. So in other words, the, as you might remember, the governor did not file a budget that was uh, for the full fiscal year, FY21. So the updated budget to get through the rest of the year was posted. Uh, I'll start with the positive news since I don't have that much in my update, although there's some good stuff coming soon, um, is Amherst ended up um, a bit to the good. 
uh, from what was budgeted for, for the Amherst Public Schools. However, the region uh, is down 95,000 from what was budgeted for, um, you know, from our initial estimates from the state. And Pelham is down 11,000, which is a lot of money for Pelham. Um, and I know some people might say those numbers for, for Amherst and Region 11 is, you know, is, is easily manageable. For Pelham, uh, that's less manageable. Uh, at those respective committee meetings, we'll go into the details, but I did want to share publicly that in terms of the governor's budget, it would have an impact on the current fiscal year because this is this is not projections for next year. It's to finish off FY21. Um, so it, it is a concern for the region um, and it is a concern for, and I don't want to minimize 95,000. That's a lot of money in any district, including the region. Um, so um, just something to be aware of that our current fiscal um, year's budget in two of the three district is at least potentially taking a turn for the worse. Um, and so again, in respective districts, I'll update you, but because that's public information in terms of cherry sheets, I thought I would share that with, with you and the public now. Um, and why don't I pause if there are questions, because um, I've got a couple other items and I will end on a positive note, I promise. Ms. Seeger. So I'm sort of new to this area of how how does it work with the governor's budget and are they looking at every school district and what the school district has proposed or is there some other thing happening that results in different districts ending up in different places? No, so what they're doing is they're uh, typically the governor's budget comes out uh, in a typical right. Well, it did come out last January and late January and then it goes to the legislature and they have conversation and they vote a budget that lasts for the next fiscal year. Um, since the process was certainly um, not linear last year and how things played out, we sort of made assumptions based on what the state had, um, but that, now it includes charter, now it includes charter reimbursement, it includes choice, it includes a number of other factors in it. So when we're looking forward from what was anticipated for state aid and now what it looks like at least potentially we would receive, there's a delta in all three districts. You know, this is again, I, I foreshadowed this earlier of the, the kind of farce of the three districts sometimes for me and Doug is that, you know, if we could average all of them together, we'd be fine. But that's not the way our districts work. We have, you know, positive variance in the Amherst Public Schools and negative variance in the other two based on what was anticipated. So, you know, when we do first quarter budget, which I think is two weeks from now, Doug can get into the weeds on all this stuff. Um, I gave him the night off, given, you know, that we had, well, not a long agenda, but a media agenda. Um, but he can get into the weeds much more on, on all the implications and the reasons. But um, it's just a cause of concern that we have essentially, you know, three digits um, number um, or 100 Ks, we would say three digits um, down there and 11,000 in Pelham um, from what was budgeted. All right. Oh, I'm sorry, there is a qu another question. Mr. Demlin? Yeah, sorry. Um, there was an update in the commissioner's update this week that uh, if you have a power outage day, and we did experience a power outage recently, um, as to whether they could be treated as snow days or not, and he got into some options there and, and locals could decide. Could you, could you get into that a little bit? Why don't I come back to that next time? Um, sure. Just because I feel like my update is, um, it's quite lengthy tonight, so uh, hopefully we'll have no storms next two weeks and we can come back to that and talk about it more fully. If that's okay with the committee. Yeah. So a couple others, distance learning survey. Thank you for those of you who filled it out. We've got hundreds of parent guardian responses, hundreds of student responses. So Emily's gonna do a great job encouraging her colleagues to uh, at the high school to fill out the survey. Thank you, Emily. And then hundreds of staff responses. So we, we appreciate that. We'll send a reminder out on Thursday because the survey's due Friday and we'll bring that back. Uh, thankfully, Obed is gonna do some analysis on that. We will also in the next week be sending out um, a well-being survey. Um, Obed has identified a survey, I think it's from Pennsylvania, Ohio, but it's a kind of tested research evidence-based survey to best understand, not at an individual level, but at a group level, how our students are experiencing um, the world. Um, and so, you know, thanks to Obed for his continued work with us. Um, but, you know, both those data sources we'll bring back and, and share both publicly with, the, you know, on our website, but also with the committee. So I just wanted to let people know that those are out there and encourage participation. We really want to know how it's going in terms of distance learning piece. 
uh, we'll only know that if, if folks respond. Um, we have some really interesting questions. I've already looked at the initial data about compared to last spring, how, does, how do things compare? And that's how we're gonna get better is by hearing not just this is great, that's really important, but also what are the current challenges that folks are facing? Um, second to last one is that I've met with the town of Amherst and we are working to make the school the school's mask free, no, excuse me, masked zones, not mask free zones, excuse me, um, that much like downtown Amherst is, uh, we've noticed that the community has been using our uh, playgrounds, our basketball courts, other things quite frequently uh, after hours. And again, you know, we see ourselves, our schools, even this weird time as, as being places we want our communities to access. Um, but we also want people wearing masks. Uh, and, and I'll be blunt that we've noticed in particularly uh, some some folks coming to our schools who are participating, you know, in, in activities we want them to do, being active, being outside, not wearing masks. And, you know, again, we'll follow the same town guidance on compliance and what happens with that. But uh, we don't currently have any rules around that. And I, you know, want to thank the Amherst town manager for his collaboration. It's already went to the health department. Um, you know, the health director has already expressed her agreement with that and we would like you know some signage and just as reminders that when people are using our facilities after hours we're still expected to use masks in the same way that downtown amherst has that um, you know i think it'll be a challenge with compliance in the same way it is other places and i still think it's an important message to give that uh, our schools are places where people should be wearing masks so i didn't want you all not to be aware that it's something i've worked on you know a little bit and just thank the town of amherst for their collaboration on that one Ready for good news? Okay, so um, my last one is we have been the fortunate recipients of multiple uh, grants over the last um, couple of weeks, and I think I, I wanted to catch up. The first is both Crocker Farm and the middle school, because of a, two years ago with their status, they were able to apply for um, TAG grants, which is assistance, and both of them are using it around measures of the opportunity gap and of $15,000 each. So um, that's great news. Both are really trying to engage their staff members uh, in how to best uh, work with students who have uh, who are not currently being as successful as we'd like them to be. Uh, we received the 36, two grants totaling $36,000 for secondary school virtual coursework to support teachers um, in developing innovative ways that uh, would work well for distance learning at the secondary level. And I'm most excited to share that we received an $84,000 grant by the Amherst Elementary Schools uh, that's supporting students' behavior and mental health and wellness program um, to, I think, be the first. So I might be misspeaking, and if I do, I will apologize later, um, to start a Bright program, uh, which is what we have at the middle school, high school, actually have an elementary Bright program. Um, which would be super neat and a little groundbreaking and the bright people have been uh, fabulous in helping us think about this. So obviously in the current situation, we have to think about what that might look like um, in a virtual context, right? This was applied for before pre-pandemic um, or at least pre-pandemic in Massachusetts. I think that's probably the more accurate way to say it. Um, but, you know, really excited to get that grant and think about how to next steps on that. Uh, the Bright folks are working with us over the next couple of weeks. We'll be doing a, a series for caregivers on how to support students' mental uh, or well-being as we head towards winter, where being outside is less of an option and it's getting a lot darker sooner and all the emotional challenges that many people, myself included, sometimes face when it gets dark at, you know, five o'clock and what that does for people's moods. Um, so we'll be doing a multi-part series for caregivers. The Bright people are fabulous. Um, we love working with them. And this is really a neat, exciting opportunity to start thinking about what would Bright look like at the elementary level? How do we support students who are going through potentially temporary uh, challenges that way? And, you know, really want to thank, you know, uh, Faye Brady, Diane Chamberlain. Uh, we're really spearheading the effort on the application of this grant. And so more soon on that, but that's sort of recent news that I wanted to celebrate. So um, wasn't quite a sandwich of good news, right? It sort of mostly was on the below the line of good news, but this this is good news, and, and we'll be following up on that. So I wanted to share that with the you know committee and the community. That's great. I may have set a record for the longest superintendent update ever, so I apologize to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Any um, 
final questions for uh, comments for the superintendent. Seeing none. Um, thank you, Dr. Morris, for that. Um, I think it, you said nine, and I wrote down seven, but maybe you 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 collapsed two into and that I <laughs> that is one. So I did. yeah, no, I was parsing them a little differently in my head than when I got into reality. So um, I could send you my cheat sheet if you want to. Look. <laughs> That's great. Um, so given given the hour, um, I, I didn't have much to say on the chair's update, but I will I will uh, cede my time um, on that and move on to number ten, item ten, which is school committee announcements. Does Anybody from any of the committees have an announcement? Ms. Lord. Yes, I would like to invite each and every one of you to our school equity task force meeting tomorrow at 6 p.m. Um, October 21st, Wednesday, and you'll find the information on our district calendar. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements? Uh, Mr. Demling. Yeah, the um, MASD, the Massachusetts Association School Committee annual conference is happening uh, in a few weeks. Obviously, it's all virtual this time. Um, I've actually never gone, even though I know a bunch of members across the state. Um, it's uh, we, You need to register by the 28th, and the committees need to designate you as the representative, and then each committee gets one vote. It's basically like a massive school committee meeting, from what I've been told. Um, <laughs> Which, you know, so if that if the sound of that appeals to you, then great. Um, if it doesn't, then no. But uh, I guess in, in, in normal times, it's a great way to, you know, uh, kind of recharge and, and connect with your colleagues, understand what a real eclectic body of people, uh, school, schools and school committees are across the state. Um, it, is, it is also a way to, to meet people who are doing other things like advocacy. Uh, they're voting on um, a, a Resolution about school funding. They're voting on a resolution about um, racism and racial awareness. Um, about a bunch of other things. The, all the information is done is on their on their website. If you're interested, um, sometimes committees have on the formal agenda, and then you vote. Uh, it's 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 really just designate. So if um, I, if we're having a meeting next week, then it could be done next week as well. But I didn't want to go by without mentioning that if people had interest. When we get to agenda planning, we'll get to that. I don't, right now, we don't necessarily have one on the agenda. So if we don't end up with a meeting, I'll just say if anybody, um, at least from Amherst and region, if anybody's interested, um, feel free to to email. Um, and I do have one one quick announcement. I almost forgot. Um, there's a meeting coming up. I'm, I'm currently serving as the um, representative on the um, formerly known as LPAC, um, English Learner Parent Advisory Council, now known as the Bilingual Parent Advisory Council. Um, and they have a meeting coming up on Tuesday next week at 7 p.m., 7 to 8 p.m. Um, the It's going to be obviously on Google Meets um, and uh, talking about a, a variety of things, including the seal of biliteracy and update on that, as well as um, updates on ELL and dual language programs and planning for the school year. So um, any families um, are uh, in interested and welcome to join and, and share ideas and, and plan for the, for the school year for that organization. Okay, moving on to our, I don't see any more announcements. So moving on to our new and continuing business. Um, we are, our first item is the superintendent goals. And Dr. Morris did email us his um, his proposal. Um, would it be helpful? It might be helpful since it wasn't in the packet to share that. Yeah, I was just going to ask if you'd like me to do that. Sure. Sure. Would you like me to briefly walk through them? Yes, please. Sure. So um, you can see that I, I added the standards. If you didn't see your email later this afternoon, I, I neglected to do that uh, on the first run. So really, uh, I want to thank you for the really thorough document that the committees sent me. Um, it was, I try not to use superlatives, but it was extremely helpful in writing these goals to know where the committees were. So thank you. 
the first one was really around, um, again, something we just talked about, social emotional wellness of students, uh, and that's including the multiple pandemics that are going on right now um, and the anti-racism curriculums being finalized. The second goal around diverse needs is uh, more specific to Amherst, but around looking at early childhood education and what that might look like and what potential there is uh, to expand it. We are going to move forward with that, um, finishing off that study that was started last year and delayed because of, um, because of COVID. The third one was kind of this one about uh, reflecting on what we're learning this year. Um, you know, it, it calls out explicitly later start times because that's one that continues to come up in terms of feedback we're receiving. Um, I imagine Emily and her colleagues have thoughts on that one and we would want to hear them. Um, you know, it's, it is the first thing that any middle school or high schooler talks about this school year mentions is that classes start at nine o'clock. I don't want to say every, but I think the majority who I've heard from uh, come on that explicitly. So, uh, but there are other things that we should absolutely talk about um, and, and, you know, try to figure out what those things are and, and engage the community. Uh, to learn from what we're, we're doing something really different than what we've ever done. And I'm not just talking about the virtual, just everything is really different. And I use the desk example, and I'm not claiming that all early childhood educators would want to use desks forever, but it was an interesting reflection three days in of like, I've changed my view now that I've actually experienced teaching young children in desks and what advantages they might have. And, and there's others, um, from large and small. Uh, the next one was, again, completing that study for the sixth grade uh, move to arms um, and engaging the community, what we planned for spring and couldn't happen, and we'll have to think of different ways to engage the community. Uh, but we, we, we need to continue to do that and need to move forward, um, and, and that'll be important as it relates to the uh, something that's in the next one, which is the elementary building project. But uh, monitor the expenses of the pandemic, and you know we sort of talked a lot about money today um, and the shortfalls that may arise. Uh, and that may influence next year. And we still want to look at the capital plan and complete ADA, you know, right? Some of these things can't wait, you know, students with disabilities can't wait years and years for our buildings to become more and more accessible. And the elementary building project, which is going to be an Amherst only agenda item in a couple minutes, that needs to continue. And we need to keep our eye on that because that's certainly uh, a priority, I know, of the Amherst School Committee. So I tried my best to weave in things that were, um, applied to all three districts when I could, uh, and but not exclude. I, I went back and forth on this about, well, should I not mention the elementary building project? And I don't think I should have goals in this job, in this town, uh, and not mentioning the Amherst elementary building project. That feel, felt uh, a little bit awkward. It would feel too general. So I don't know if I got the right mix, but that's sort of what I was attempting to do, is take the document you all offered, offered things that there's broad agreement in the three committees as priorities and also when there were individual items in individual districts call them out explicitly so that there wasn't confusion uh, around them so i'm open to any and all feedback you know tonight or certainly if there's individual feedback people want to give me after they've had a chance to reflect on these and and offer them but you know i tried to do my best to take the documents you all shared with me and put them into actionable goals Neat. Uh, Mr. Demling. So I like the list. I think you did a good job translating the school committee document. Um, this is an ambitious list. Um, if you if you dropped almost all of this, you would still have a very full plate given what's going on with with COVID times. Um, and um, more might be added. You know, we talked last year, and we'll talk a little bit during planning about. What if we radically altered next year's school committee calendar and you know had school during parts of summer and big ideas like that that if we seriously start to explore are going to involve a lot of your time so you know I, like i want to set you up to succeed i i don't disagree with any of these things as values um but you know does does this feel manageable for you given everything else that's going on i don't know what manageable means at this point and that's sort of in jest and sort of not um um, I do think the things that need to happen, right? And so, you know, like I'll pick the second one, right? So that's the probably the most specific and finite one. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to be able to expand preschool access next in fiscal year 22, given what I know about fiscal year 21 and what I pre presume about fiscal year 22. We still need to complete the study. Right, so um, you know, I I think 
you know, we wait too long between two phases of a study and the study becomes meaningless because it actually doesn't, you know, one part doesn't speak to the other part. So I, I do think it is. I think, you know, much like this past year, as long as the committees are comfortable that things may change, right, and priorities may change, you know, I think, you know, we had a good model, in my opinion, for that and how the evaluation worked and how goals worked this year. And as long as we keep that spirit, I feel like it's it's probably the, the right approach to have. I had a similar question, but I bet you, uh, for me at least, you've answered it well. <laughs> so, and thank you. Any other comments, input, questions? Dr. Morris. I, I typically do this, and she definitely can uh, ignore me, and that's fine. But I wonder if Emily just has some thoughts if, if some of these goals speak to you know what students particularly at the high school level and i'm not asking you to be representative sample of all students at the high school but as you look at this list are these the type of things that you think we all should be working on uh, to improve the experience of high school students and, and it, you know that's a yes no question i probably shouldn't have asked it that way but if you had any thoughts to share we're open to hearing them or i am and i think i speak for the committee and if not or if you want to think about it, get back to me, um, that's fine too. But I always love hearing from the student experience. I want to give you the opportunity explicitly. Um, I think I'll get back to you. I'm going to talk to some more students and sort of, yeah. Awesome. I'll, I'll email you this document explicitly so you you have it um, on file. And I, again, I'm very open to hearing what uh, students would, would think and, and adjusting it based on that because that's you're all why we're here. So um, I'll make sure you get that. Any other thoughts um, for now? We will be coming back to this at a future meeting. We're not voting on this tonight, so. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> and now we're moving on to um, our next item, which is future agenda planning, which we've alluded to multiple times. Um, I can try to pull that up if, um, to share that, just give me one second. And there it is. Oops, no, that's the wrong one. I can't seem to find it in my email. Do you, want me to, do, you want me to, do you want me to take a look for it? Yeah, if you could. That would in the packet, so I can project what's in the packet. But if we're going to edit it, then I can't. <laughs> I think it's this one. Yep, oh, I found it. So I will share. Whoops. Okay, are folks seeing this? Uh, let me see if I can make it bigger. <clears throat> that better? Good. Okay. Um, so this is this is just a. Um, it looks more official than I would say it is. This is just um, to start the conversation um, and look at sort of a potential schedule, um, so that we can then. In the past, what we've been, what we the last year sort of use this document to map out the full year where we could. Um, so once we have finalized our goals, there's a lot that we know about what our future agendas might be looking like. And, and it, we found it helpful, just speaking from the Amherst committee perspective as well as the region, um, to map them out where possible, because then we, then we can 
we know what to expect and we know sort of when we're adding things to our plate, you know, what impact that might have on sort of future long meetings. Um, now we're moving to two and a half hours right now. <laughs> so, um, so in the past, the region has met typically twice a month, every other week, and Amherst has met once a month. I didn't add Pelham on here because honest, I'm sorry, but I didn't know what Pelham's schedule <laughs> usually has been. Um, so, um, and we had talked, as I recall at our last meeting, there was both interest in having um, joint, continuing joint meetings where it made sense. Um, and then also thinking of, um, as, as we just heard, Pelham needs um, uh, Pelham only meetings and um, given some of these goals that are Amherst only um, potentially need for Amherst only meetings as well. So I didn't I didn't note going forward when you know which ones might be joint meetings and which ones might not. And so I guess the question um, for us to consider is: Do we want to map those out, or do we want you know which ones might be joint and which ones might not? Do we want to do that sort of on a monthly basis? Look look at it and figure out which ones might be joint, um, and and just sort of you know, use this as our starting point and, and adjust as needed and um, as, as things come up throughout the year. So uh, I just spoke a lot. So uh, <laughs> welcome, welcome ideas and suggestions um, from anybody on the three committees. Ms. Dancer. Um, it, it seems to me that at least for the next little bit that we might try to plan as we go in terms of whether we're going to have joint meetings or not, um, depending on perhaps what the Amherst committee decides they need to talk about, what the region needs to talk about, and what Pelham needs to talk about. But certainly, it seems to me there are going to be some times when we're still going to all want to be in the same meeting. Just my thoughts. So, um, uh, sorry, I, I saw some people moving to, but just to restate, if I'm hearing, would you be is are, is what you're suggesting sort of put a placeholder that every time there's an RS a region meeting on here, put in parens joint potential joint meeting. Is that sort of what you're? Yep. Yeah. yeah, I th I think we could do that, and then. If we cancel the joint meeting, I don't think anybody's going to complain. <laughs> Certainly for the Amherst representatives, it won't make too much difference. <laughs> um, Mr. Demling, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, one, I'm not sure how much of many of us are going to show up to that November 3rd meeting. We might want to move that date. I think there's something happening that night. You know, I get the joke. No? All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, th I think in general, like laying the tracks in directly in front of us has been working out pretty well. I mean, maybe it's been much more difficult and chaotic from, from your point of view because you're the one who has to actually schedule and post it. But um, I think I think it's a lot. It's like weather forecasting. I think it's a lot clearer whether we'll need a joint meeting when we're a week or two out from it than when we're you know three or four months out. So. Um, and I think I think uh, people, given the size of our joint committees, people have been remarkably flexible in terms of, uh, you know, oh, all of a sudden we need a joint meeting, or this has to be Amherst and Region, and um, we get very high attendance. So um, I'm I'm okay with not having a set schedule months in advance. You know, if if this stuff if this is a straw man and it has to move around quite a bit based on need, that's I mean that works for me, and it seems seems it seems to have worked for others in the past. Ms. Hall? Uh, yeah, I would say the same. I'm, I'm fine having it be as needed. I mean, my attendance can continue. I, what else are we going to do, right? <laughs> so, it's fine with me. <laughs> I don't have plans. <laughs> Any other thoughts? I think, um, you know, part of it, part of my motivation is also just so that we, you know, 
sort of set this agreement that tentatively we'll be meeting every other week unless that we have a need for another, you know, an adding a meeting, canceling a meeting or moving a meeting, right? Um, but I think that also helps that the community understand like when is the next meeting and sort of see forward, um, you know, and, and everybody knows it's subject to change. I think, you know, at least sort of seeing that, that what the cadence is can be helpful for the community as well. Um, so then looking at that November 3rd date, um, I don't know, I was sort of like thinking people might want something else less stressful to watch, but <laughs> you don't think people will tune away and, and check in on the joint committee meetings? <laughs> um, Mr. Menino. I plan to watch TV 24 hours a day on that date. <laughs> um, so do we want to look to the week after that the um or the next week or what are um or just a different day during that week of the second miss dancer what if we just move it to thursday is that going to conflict with anything else for people ah i see your hand I have a conflict that night. I could definitely do the Wednesday. Um, the uh, fourth, I guess. Yep, the fourth. Um, I would have a hard time doing that Thursday. Yeah, that's the last Thursday of a conflict. But I do have that, a conflict that Thursday. Are folks okay with the Wednesday, the fourth? Seeing lots of thumbs up. Great. Um, and if there are the other question that I had was um, earlier in, in this meeting, we talked about um, Ms. Lloyd brought up the idea of um, advocacy work for um, maintaining Chapter 70 funding um, for FY22. I think that, I'm not sure if I'm phrasing. I just scribbled that down um, as you were speaking, and I wanted to know if that was something that we wanted to consider a resolution um, on that next meeting. That might be building on what Dr. Morris said. That might be too late. It might be better for us to do that individually. Um, but just sort of tossing that out there for the committee um, is that something that the committee would be interested in addressing? Then I see a few nodding heads. Okay. So we'll add that. And um, Dr. Morris, does that timing work for an update on an update on Q1? It does. Yeah. Great. No, yeah, and I added the AFSPE piece as well, potentially. Oh, right. Okay. That would be a region only, but it would be, I think, a relatively brief, brief item. Okay. Great. Uh, Mr. Demling. Yeah, before we leave agenda plan, I did want to see if there was uh, general committee interest in exploring this idea of uh, major changes to the FY22 calendar slash structure. Um, this was brought up, I, I think, in public comment last week, um, or that we received offline. Uh, this idea of starting the school year a lot earlier, maximizing time during the summer, um, not to get into the pros and cons of it, but is there is, is there community is there committee interest in exploring it? Because if there is, this is something that we would want to probably start looking at earlier rather than later. Um, Mr. Menino, and then Ms. Butcher. Yes, I, I think we should explore it earlier rather than later. And I saw some other thumbs up, so I think uh, that's a that's a yes. So we'll add that. <laughs> we need now that we have the raised hand, we need a thumbs up um, emoji, a reaction in here too. Um, Ms. Stancer, did you have a, a question? Did you mean Spitzer? Because I, I had my hand up. Oh, sorry. Um, go ahead, Ms. Spitzer. I'm, I, but I also see um, Ms. Stancer's raised hand too. But go, go ahead, Ms. Spitzer. Sorry, so I just wanted to second that. I mean, I, I think I brought it up also 
prior to the public comment at, at when we were going over the calendar. Um, so the only thing I wanted to flag as something to consider is that I think similar to some of the other things we've talked about tonight, it might be part of um, a contract. Um, but so I'm just curious about like the process by which can we talk about it first before we enter? New just wanted to raise that um, as a process issue. Dr. Morris. It certainly would be part of negotiations, but I think in this particular regard, um, I don't see any con. It's not a, it's not part of any current negotiations. I think as long as it's spoken about as the committee exploring an interest, knowing that it would have to be negotiated, I don't see any. You know, I thought about this one, and, and at first I had more of a negative read on it, and then I kind of thought more about it, and I think the committee should feel free to talk about it, knowing that any decision a committee would come to would have to be go through impact bargaining with um, with bargaining units. But I don't I don't see as a need to hold off on that um, at all, given that it's not currently a topic of negotiations. And, you know, as long as you have that caveat in mind, I don't see a conflict. Okay. Okay. Miss, there's a hand up. Miss Hall, I think. Oh, Miss Hall, sorry. <laughs> I'm looking for the wrong white emoji. Sorry, <laughs> old fashioned. Um, I well, and I don't know if it makes sense to follow up with this later, but Dr. Morris, do you think that next week is too soon for a Pelham only meeting to talk enrollment and other matters, or do you want to take this offline and we can I can follow up with the rest of the committee after we talk? I don't think it's too soon. Uh, I don't think I'll have particularly more data then, but I think some of the questions about comparing to past years will be easily to easy to uh, accumulate and uh, that'd be fine with me to meet next week in Pelham. We could certainly follow up line on the agenda, but I do think this is an acute issue we shouldn't wait too long to talk about. Okay, all right. Um, okay, I would, the, I'll check in with committee members and you on availability another time, but let's assume next week. All right, thanks. Okay, okay if there's no other comments and um... Again, given our late hour, we'll move along to uh, warrant reports. Um, I have two. I see Ms. Spitzer nodding. Ms. Spitzer, why don't you go? Um, so I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $461,274.64 for the warrant dated October 6, 2020. This included general fund expenses of $158 thousand six hundred forty four dollars and fourteen cents revolving fund expenses of one hundred and forty thousand nine hundred sixty three dollars and thirty cents and grant fund expenses of one hundred and fifty three thousand eight hundred seventeen dollars and twenty cents and other funds for capital in the amount of seven thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars and I signed this on October 8th 2020 in addition, I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $637,052.09 for a warrant dated October 8th, 2020. And this included um, general fund expenses in that amount. And it was dated, um, signed by me and dated October, on October 8th, 2020. And then one last one, um, on October, Ninth, or sorry, for a warrant dated. Sorry, this one doesn't have the nice cover sheet for me. <laughs> um, I signed a warrant dated October seventh, twenty twenty, for payroll expenses in the amount of three hundred ninety four thousand seven hundred dollars, seven hundred three dollars and fifty one cents. That is. Sorry, I'm just looking at the document and. Let me correct myself, please, because I, I find the cover sheets at the end. So I'm going to scrap what I just wrote, and I'm going to read one more time, sorry. So I, Carrie Spitzer, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $758,689.49 for the warrant dated October 7th, 2020, and this authorized payroll in that amount for October 7th, 2020, and I signed that on October 9th, 2020. Thank you. And Ms. Hall. Okay, um, I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $75,320.64 
for the warrant dated October 16th, 2020. This included general fund expenses of $37,241.97 and grant fund expenses of $38,078.67. Uh, and I signed that on October 16th. And then I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $58,428.22 for the warrant dated October 21st, 2020. Um, and that was that full amount, the 58,428.22 was all for payroll. And I signed that on October 19th. And I have two for the Amherst um, district. Um, I, Alison McDonald, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $657,379.48 for a warrant dated October 7th, 2020. Um, that was all um, payroll in the amount of $657,379.48, um, and I signed that on October 8th. And I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $143,303.38 for a warrant dated October 9th. 2020. This included general fund expenses of $68,147.39, revolving fund expenses of $180.40, and grant fund expenses of $15,536.47, FEMA fund of thirty-one $31,843.19, COVID relief grant in the amount of $632, CARES, fund, CARES Act fund of $26,782.93, and a gift to the school in the amount of $181. And I signed that on October 14th. We now um, move on to gifts. And in our packets, we had um, two gifts, one for the region and one for Amherst. And I actually have that all set up so I can project. <laughs> Are folks seeing this now? Uh, would somebody like from Amherst like to make a motion? I'm happy to. Ms. Spitzer. Um, I move that the Amherst School Committee accept the following gifts from the Fort River Parent Council, number 2105, to support the Fort River Library for anti-racism materials in the amount of $500. And from Martha Alver, number 995877, to support Crocker Farm at the principal's discretion in the amount of $10 for a total of $510. Second. We'll moved by Spitzer, second by McDonald. Any discussion? Move to a vote of the Amherst School Committee. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, I motion passes five to zero. And now from the region, we have one gift. Um, I'll make the motion. Um, I move uh, for the regional school committee that we accept the following gift from Jennifer Casasanto Donor Advised Fund in the Raymond James Charitable Fund number check number one five three one four three to support remote teaching needs in the amount of $800. Second. Is there a second? Moved by McDonald, second by Spitzer. We'll take a roll call vote of the region. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. And the motion passes nine to zero. A 
Okay. Um, and it stopped sharing. Uh, okay. Um, I move to adjourn the regional school committee. Is there a second? Second. Um, moved by McDonald's, second by Kenny. No discussion. Um, and we'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. And the region is adjourned. Chair Hall. Oh, you have a question or a comment? That was just a goodbye. Sorry, I thought. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so confused by hands tonight. I'm not getting any of it right. <laughs> All right, on that note, I will move to adjourn the Pelham School Committee. Uh, is there a second? Second. Second. All right, moved by Hall, seconded by Stancer? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right, roll call vote, Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, aye. Ms. Barlow? Barlow, aye. And Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. And Hall, aye. Pelham is adjourned. <laughs> it seems that we we all seem so large now on the screen because everybody <laughs> there's only five of us um so we have one a uh, one agenda item and it's to hear an update on the msba elementary school building project um so uh, uh i'll ask uh dr morris if you can help us out with that yeah, sure. I'll be brief. So the next, well, the next, the first meeting of the building committee is next Tuesday, the 27th at 730 in the morning. So uh, the building committee has been formed and populated with members through the town manager and that process with the town council. Uh, people have been sworn in. Um, so we're looking forward to that meeting and getting getting things off to a good start. So um, we're, we're, we're raring to go with that. Uh, in terms of the district level, the non-larger committee, we've been in uh, multiple conversations with the MSBA uh, around enrollment and um, you know enrollment projection. And so at this point, we continue to go back and forth. I have another conversation with them later this week. Um, just trying to narrow down our options uh, that we want to study. Again, there's no surprises here. Um, you know, we are looking at an option to, as was required of just looking at the building as is and just managing that. Uh, an option of 600 students, you know, in a school that's either K to five or K to six, depending on what we do. Uh, and then perhaps a somewhere in between model, you know, if if kind of the Crocker Farm study that came out, if the town decided it, it opted to spend money on its own, the MSB is very clear that that they wouldn't participate in an expansion of Crocker Farm. That's would be a townwide decision um of of something in between those two numbers so you know they have their own projections they have their own uh resources it's been really helpful the town um someone from the town hall has been helpful in terms of people knowing about new developments and rentals and, and how to look at our town which is funky in terms of how to analyze it from a housing perspective because it doesn't follow typical trends um that most communities do you know we've, for instance a higher rate of rentals of single family homes than most communities would have um that you know that kind of thing uh town-wide there's more transiency because of the nature of the universities and the colleges that affect it so we've had some really useful conversations uh when anything we would get to resolution i'll bring it back to the committee that's not where we are but as it always is, my experience, a very collaborative effort from the MSBA staff. I feel like they're incredibly professional, knowledgeable, and they also understand Amherst, which is really nice uh, to know. So that's sort of where we are is we're still looking at enrollment, enrollment um, you know, numbers and what that would look like. Uh, we are going to study multiple options. This is required as part of the MSBA study. Uh, and our first meeting is next week. So that's sort of a quick summary. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Ms. Spitzer. Um, so two quick ones. I'm curious, are those the 7.30 a.m. morning meetings, are those going to be 
live streamed and recorded or uh, I'm just curious about access to those if, um, if at all. And then the second question was, you know, with the numbers that you were showing us early and the decline in enrollment, I mean, that kind of <coughs> me for or raised a red flag for me thinking about the elementary schools and it seemed like our three elementary schools were actually a little bit less and particularly Fort River was the smallest decline percentage wise, which was nice to see. Cause I think that's, I, 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 I don't know, but I'm just curious about your thoughts on like, do we need to be, it's late. <laughs> do we need to be concerned about that decline in enrollment with regard to the MSBA project? Yeah, their projections are set and they were based off uh, prior years information. So, you know, uh, they've been very clear as they always are being so thoughtful that they know enrollments right now are really atypical and changing. Um, and their practice is that they're going to stay the course with their methods. Um, and so, you know, we were explicit that we're seeing a change and they say every district they're working with is seeing some level of change. Um, so we are moving forward, you know, with, with the projections that were developed from in the multiple sources they have. Um, and they're looking primarily at birth years. And uh, when they say survival rate, they mean how many kids were born five years prior and how many students show up in the public schools. And I think that word could be misinterpreted uh, given the context. But um, so they have all those things and they know the survival rate is going to be super wacky for every district right now. And so they're, you know, my sense is that their understanding of that and not trying to over dramatize the impact on a building project from that. Uh, the, the meeting is posted with the Zoom link because it's, it's the town. So it's already been posted uh, on that. The topics are call to order introductions, discuss the charge of the elementary school building committee, identify a chair, a vice chair of the elementary school, but, and vice chair, excuse me, of the elementary school building committee meeting schedule, future planning, items not anticipated by the chair 48 hours before the meeting, kind of funny so not the chair is now, public comment and adjourn. So that's been set and posted by town staff um, and the, the link and how to access it and all that's on the town website where meetings will be posted. So on that, um, following up on, on that um, thought about meetings posted, um, we did create, the, the district did create a, a page on the elementary, the building project, and I wonder, um, I don't want to create extra, extra work, but I think there'll be some sort of expectation that sort of um, agendas and minutes will be, will be posted there. Um, so that might be helpful to sort of start that habit now from the very first beginning so that people know that. Agreed. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Seeing none. Okay. Great. Um, so then we have one last agenda item. <laughs> the Amherst School Committee. I'll second that. So um, moved by uh, Spitzer, second by McDonald. No discussion. Um, Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And I'm going out of order now. I'm going just by on screen. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Mr. Dilling. McDonald, I. <laughs> Despite Mr. Demling's opposition, we are in. <laughs> please, please make it for the record that I said nay. <laughs> passes four. Okay. four. I, I am breaking the streak. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I am channeling the spirit of Mr. Sullivan. He, he, you know, three hours just isn't long enough. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, um, we are adjourned officially. So thank you. Good night. Good night.